I'm here to present Dr. Cecilia Klein. Uh, Dr. Cecilia Klein is Professor Emerita of Pre-Columbian Art History at UCLA, where she taught Mesoamerican and Andean Art History for 25 years. Specializing in the iconography and political functions of Aztec art before, during, and after the conquest, Dr. Klein has written articles on masking, ritual auto-sacrifice, the symbolism of human body parts, and gender representations in Aztec art. She is the editor of Gender in Pre-Hispanic America, which includes her article on the symbolic value of ambiguous gender signs in Aztec culture. Please welcome Dr. Cecilia Klein. Aztecs 
to propose a new identity for these goggle figures at Chichen Itza. Not only do I suspect that the Aztecs derived some of their ideas and practices from Yucatan, but we all know that both the builders of Chichen Itza and the Aztecs drew upon a common source, early post-classic Tula as well. I will return to this last point at the end of my talk. At Chichen Itza, the slightly earlier of the goggled figures we will look at appear in recent um, panels on the upper sides of a very small, very small, low platform known today as the platform of the eagles and the jaguars. And thanks to Jeffrey Braswell for that photograph. Because the platform's modern name is rather long, I will henceforth refer to it simply as E and J. E and J stands on the east side of the Great Plaza in the northern part of Chichen Itza, where despite having been heavily restored in 1951, that was done by a uh, actually, uh, it has been largely ignored by scholars. Jeffrey Braswell and Nancy Peniche May, on the basis of their recent excavations of the Great Plaza, date the construction of ENJ at approximately AD 1000. That is, at the beginning of the early post-classic period. The second set of goggled figures to be discussed appears in three horizontal friezes running around the pyramidal base of the much larger and much better known Temple of the Warriors. On the screen, I will henceforth label this building as TW. Note that it more or less faces ENJ from across the plaza. Roswell and Fenice May think it was built shortly, at, shortly after ENJ when it was erected over a smaller temple pyramid known today as the Temple of the Chak Mol. I will return later to the Temple of the Chak Mol, which is now thought to have been contemporary with E and J. On the screen now are two drawings. The one at the top shows a typical goggle figure on E and J, and the one on the bottom a typical example from the Temple of the Warriors. Although, as you can see, the two figures are not identical in every detail, their similarities are so obvious that one has to assume that they represent the same type of subject. Particularly evident are their ringed eyes and their enigmatic rec reclining pose with the head turned backward 180 degrees. So I am not going to touch again. I, I cannot tell you why they take that particular pose. Um, something to work up. Speech scrolls in front of their face tell us that they are speaking or chanting. I'm not putting these up to you. I hope you see it. So great. Yeah. Um, on both buildings as well, the figures hold with both hands a long tubular object from which issue several long wavy balloons. Finally, irregularly shaped forms hover like clouds above, in front of, and or behind the figures. However, the artist of the picture at the top here didn't have good eyes. So he misunderstood to some degree what he was seeing, and for that reason we're switching to photographs. The two on the screen show that on both monuments, stacked bows with pronounced knots adorn not only the subject's knees, ankles, and wrists, but also the long tubes they carry. Stacked bows also appear at the front of the E and J figure's headband, right on his forehead. Whereas on the Temple of the Warriors, a very large double bow with a very conspicuous knot gathers the subject's hair into a top knot. Other photographs show us that on both structures, and I'm just showing you one now, the figures are paired feet to feet and are accompanied by one or two eagles <coughs> and a jaguar, all holding a heart. 
Well, let's go back because uh, I want to just come on here. On E and J, which you see here, I guess the little caption is letting you see that. The jaguar is the biggest, and he's in the middle in a recess panel. And then there's an eagle to either side, and the two reclining figures are in uh, a panel up above. On the temple of the warriors, where the creatures are aligned with the goggle figures, there is also an unidentified furry beast with a stubby tail. So if any of you are from Yucatan, and you know the fauna there, and you think you know who this is, I'd love to know. Nobody has ever been able to figure out what that little furry guy is. So who were these math men? <laughs> Although or perhaps because they are unique at Chichen, that is, you will not see them anywhere else, very few scholars have paid them any attention. The great German iconographer and linguist Edward Zähler who interpreted the large, long tubular object as a weapon, proposed in 1908 that the goggled figures on ENJ represented the souls of warriors who had sacrificed their lives in order to keep the sun in motion. In Aztec times, he noted, some of the highest ranking warriors belonged to a military order of the eagle or the jaguar, and both orders were responsible for providing sacrificial victims to feed the sun. And later wasn't that far off the mark, I have to say. The distinguished Mayanist J. Eric S. Thompson, in turn, argued in a short, informal 1943 essay that the reclining figures on the Temple of the Warriors represented a supernatural known to the Aztecs as Tlachitonatu, sun near the earth. Pochichinatio, however, had no cult among the Aztecs, is seldom mentioned in colonial sources, was to my knowledge never represented in sculpture, and seldom appears in manuscript paintings. When he does appear, as the figure on your left demonstrates, beyond his eye rings, he looks nothing at all like the reclining figures at Chichen. Um, Oh, Thompson also identified this big tube that they hold as a weapon. What the Chichen Itza figures do look like, I suggest, are Aztec fireproofs. Four of them, skin blackened, appear at the center of this well-known page from the Aztec Codex Borbonicus, which depicts a new fire ceremony taking place in the month called Pan Ketanitli. Something else everybody probably already knows, but just briefly, at the end of every 52 years, the Aztecs extinguished all fires in their realm in fear that the sun might fail to rise the next morning. Once the constellation we know as the Pleiades passed through the meridian, new fire was drilled on a hilltop south of the capital to signify that the sun would continue to rise each morning for another 52 years. As seen at the far left and bottom of this page, high-ranking Aztec priests, each dressed as a different Aztec deity, process toward the heart carrying a large bundle of faggots. Like the larger, more prominent fire priests at the center, they will insert their bundle into the flames, converting it to a burning torch used to distribute the new fire to the rest of the citizenry. Later, 52 rods, representing the past 52 years in the cycle, will be bundled together to look like the stone replica on the screen, and then it will be ritually cremated. Note that like the goggle figures at Chichen Itza, these priests have stacked bows at their ankles and upper arms, and additional stacked bows wrapped around their bundles of sticks. From other images, we know that these bows, which were made of paper, were also tied on mortuary bundles awaiting cremation. The bows, therefore, must have signified a relationship to fire and burning. Thus, it is not surprising that stacked bows are also a diagnostic attribute of the bright red Aztec fire serpent, or Shiukoat which carries them on his rattlesnake tail. In Yucatan, the Pleiades were known as Thap, rattlesnake's tail. 
Moreover, during Pankasalitli, the fire serpent appeared among the celebrants as a flaming paper torch. The Franciscan Bernardino de Sahagun's Aztec informants described it, quote, as just like a blazing pine firebrand with a tongue of flaming red feathers that went as if it were burning like a torch, end quote. I therefore propose here, this is a proposition, that the wavy irregular volutes issuing from the long tubes held by the Chichen Itza reclining figures are flames, and the floating symbols above them, clouds of smoke. The tubes, in other words, are not weapons. They are torches. And don't be misled by the fact that they're slender, because if I had time to show you lots of images, I'd show you that these torches are often represented as very slender. In Yucatan, at the time of the conquest, according to Bishop Diego de Landa, preparing and lighting a new fire was the responsibility of priests known as the Chaks. These men derived their group name from the Maya god Chak, who, like Tlaloc, was in charge of rain and thunder, his fiery lightning bolts conceived of as a fire-breathing serpent. Unfortunately, there is relatively little additional information on the Chaks. However, we do know quite a bit about Aztec fire priests who belong to one of two internally ranked orders. Their order was headed by a man titled Tlaloc Potek Tlamakoski, or Our Lord Tlaloc Priest. All of these Tlaloc priests were in one way or another responsible for, among other things, fire rituals. And all of them seem to have dressed to look like Tlaloc as well. Thaibun, for example, remarked that the lowest level offering priests were often referred to as the Tlaloke, or Tlalocs, a reference to the god's dwarfish supernatural assistants, who we know from other images look just like him. Conversely, Thaibun described the Tlaloke, or the Tlalocs, as looking, quote, like the offering priests, end quote. The higher level Tlaloc priests, the Tlenomakake, those who handled the incense burner, or you can translate it as the fire givers, they dressed as Tlaloc as well. For example, one of the most senior fire priests bore the title Tlalocan Tlenomakake, or fire giver of Tlalocan. Tlalocan was the name of Tlaloc shrine at the most sacred temple pyramid in the realm be the Temple Mayor. This man appeared ceremonially, Sa'agun tells us, during the month called Etzequanitli, which was dedicated to Tlaloc, wearing the god's hair and feather headdress, as well as what the prayer called his, quote, rain mask, or, quote, his Tlaloc mask. The high priest titled Epkar Kukwilzon also would have worn Tlaloc's insignia. Tlaloc was also known as Epkoa, serpent of mother of pearl, and Epkoa, shell serpent. And his temple was sometimes referred to as Itupan Epkoa, temple of the shell serpent, which probably explains, well, maybe not probably, but I suggest it may explain why those eye rings are made of shell. According to Sagun, it was this priest who was in charge of the new fire ceremony and the binding of the years. I think it is he, or other of the higher ranking fire priests, who are represented in sculptures and paintings of elaborately dressed men, and in one in Codex Bogonicus, the women as well, wearing a Tlaloc mask that covers all or just the upper part of their face. Note that both of the ceramic figures on the screen hold a snaky lightning bolt. Some of these masked priests, like the two now on the screen, I have to change the picture, even have Maltese crosses on their eyes. I forgot to point this out, but, but the far priest in Codex Borbonicus actually don't have rings around their eyes. They have Maltese crosses around their eyes. 
It seems to me quite likely that the costume discovered 14 years ago in an offering at the Aztec's main temple, which included a wooden Tlaloc mask, once belonged to the Tlaloc priest in charge of new fire and the cremation of the year bundle. There are additional reasons to think that the reclining figures at ENJ and the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza represent far priests. First, the torches held by all of the ENJ figures and at least some of the Temple of the Warrior figures support a slightly convex disc with a serrated edge. The arrows will show you where those are. There is good reason to read these discs as solar symbols, which is in fact what Thompson did. He thought they simply represented the sun. But we, because we see, if you look at other Chichen images, particularly paintings, you see that the way they represented the sun was with a serrated disc or as a serrated disc. But the sun was also represented at Chichen Itza by pyrite mirrors found in offerings. Mirrors that have an articulated edge and a back beautifully inlaid with tiny tesserae of tur turquoise and other precious stones. The one on the screen, which has been restored, was found in an offering in front of the missing altar in the temple of the Chakmol, which I mentioned earlier. You recall that the temple of the Chakmol was contemporary with E and J, and it faced it across the plaza. When viewed in cross-section, as you can see over here on the right, the mirror's profile is slightly convex, just like the serrated discs on the tubes carried by the goggled reclining figures. Although they not, uh, are not easy to make out here, this mirror is actually decorated with four stylized heads of fire serpents. And that goes back to what Bob Cogan was talking about. We'll come back to that. Fire serpent heads also adorn an earlier mirror found in a building underlying the famous Castillo at Chen. Like many other mirrors found at Chichen Itza, this one had been burned. In 1987, Clemency Coggins presented, I think, persuasive evidence that this was because new fire had been literally drilled on these mirrors. I therefore propose that the convex serrated discs supported by the fire priest torches on the Chichen uh, buildings that, uh, we're talking about, that they represent solar mirrors used in a new fire ceremony. As such, they testify to the torchbearer's responsibility for the new fire rituals that kept the sun in motion. Both the eagle and the jaguar make perfect sense here because they were present at the sun's birth from a fiery heart, where by throwing themselves into the fire, they helped it to begin its first passage through the firmament. So it's a kind of a primordial reenactment of that very important moment of creation. Second, at the temple of the Chak Mole, large stone columns carved in the form of inverted feathered serpents once flanked the entrance to the shrine. Feathered serpent columns are commonly seen on buildings on the great platform. But scholars usually identify them as Quetzalcoatl, whose name means Quetzal feathered serpent. However, the feathers of the Quetzal bird, from which Quetzalcoatl's name is derived, are famously green. And the feathered serpent um, that you see at the temple of the Chakmal was very conspicuously painted red the color of fire serpents, and I'm not the first person to notice that. Clark Coggins pointed that out some time ago. Coggins thought that the feathered serpent columns at the Castillo Sub and elsewhere at Chichen were fire serpents as well. I think she might have been right. The importance of the fire serpent at Chichen Itza, in my opinion, has been obscured by the current vogue for seeing every serpent there as a pencil caught. I wish Carl Taba were here because I know he's. <laughs> but I, we're a minority. <laughs> As another indication, what, John, wake up because I want you to see this. John. <laughs> okay, you have to look. You have to look. <laughs> As another indication, 
indication that fire servant was important at the Temple of the Temple. I show you drawings and fragments of what were originally eight large serpents, each with a shoulder and a clawed hand, painted on the interior walls of both chambers, and they were very large, apparently. Similar serpents were painted in the northwest colonnade fronting the Temple of the Warriors, where archaeologists have found what appear to be large fire pits. According to Peter Schmidt, more of these serpents were also painted in the vault of the inner temple of the Big Tables, which stood just north of the Temple of the Chakmol, and was contemporary with it and E and J. So all these buildings are being decorated in a very similar way at the same time. So who are these serpents? They were painted against a bright red background. They have a segmented body with spiky triangles running along its edges. Both the segments and the triangles were filled in with a variety of alternating colors. The lead excavator of the temples of the Chakmol and the Temple of Warriors, Earl Morris, suggested in 1931 that these were what he called sun serpents. He based his reading on the rows of triangles, which he related to the rays on a solar disk. However, his wife, Anne McAchtel Morris, who studied the murals in great detail, noted the similarity of the serpent's unusual form and coloring to a serpent on page three of the late post-classic Mishchek Codex Zushnatol. Although Morris did not identify the Zushnatol serpent, and therefore nobody tried to identify the serpents at Chichen Itza either, scholars have subsequently recognized this as a primordial fire serpent. We know now, in fact, thanks mostly to the work of uh, Zoltan Palahini, that rows of triangles connoted fire as far back as early classic Teotihuacan. The serpents in Chichen Itza's temples of the Chakmol and the Big Tables, as well as the Northwest Colonnade, are therefore surely fire serpents, or at least I'm trying to convince you of that. <laughs> And all of these structures, I propose, played an important role in fire rituals. Third, E and J is what is known as a radial platform. That is, it is square in plan with a stairway on each of its four sides. As Coggins pointed out, throughout the classic and post-classic periods, the Maya and Central Mexicans used radial platforms for fire rituals at the completion of calendrical cycles. The most important of these involved new fire ceremonies. Although Landa said that he saw Chichen Itza's radio platforms being used for dances and comedic performances in the mid-16th century, the 19th century Desiree Charnay, who was mentioned by uh, Bob Kobe, point, he pointed out that because the people's religion was being savagely suppressed at the time, they surely would have felt it unsafe to continue the ritual that had been originally performed there. In some of Boone's Vermeer's Memorialis depiction of the Aztec's main ceremonial precinct, a black fire priest holding a flaming incensario stands on a small, what I think is probably a radial platform, aligned with the main temple. A skull rack, or so pumply, appears below, which means behind it, uh, and um, with a, a, a ball cord located directly beneath or behind it. So there's an alignment there between the big temple at the top, the little radio platform, the skull rack, and the ball cord. This arrangement recalls Chichen's great platform, where E and J stands in front of the site's famous skull rack which in turn stands in front of the great ball court. But the Aztecs' radial platforms were, like the Maya, specifically used in new fire ceremonies. This made clear in Saad Boon's Vermeer's Memorialis depiction of the events of Pankatsalitli, the month in which new fire was grilled. There we see a priest holding an ignited torch while standing on a small, presumably radial platform located directly in front of the main temple. All of the 
foregoing may indicate that at least some of what we know about Aztec fire priests was directly based on fire priests at Chichen Itza. It seems equally likely, however, to me anyway, that both the Aztecs and the people of Chichen Itza may have modeled their fire priests after those living at the central Mexican site of Tula at approximately the same time that E&J, the inner temple of the big tables, the temple of the Chacmol, and shortly thereafter, the temple of the warriors were erected. In other words, this is all happening at the same time at both sites. Well, time, time precludes my delving uh, deeper into this matter today. Let me point out that Tula's largest pyramid, which Bob pointed out earlier, pyramid, which today we call Pyramid C, it faces west exactly like the Temple of the Warriors. Uh, it directly faced a small radial platform, which is known today as the Adoratorio, and which Desiree Charnay destroyed, um, behind which was a skull rack, which was in front of a ball court. Tula is also well known, as Bob pointed out also, for its numerous architectural reliefs of burning mirrors and real mirrors buried in offerings, one of which is decorated with the heads of fire serpents. And you can't see that, but he pointed that out also. That we've got the same thing going on here at Tula. Even more important are the many stone carved reliefs at Tula that depict reclining figures, many of which wear stacked leg bows. These figures have been previously interpreted, as you mentioned, as um, either dead rulers, or he, I think he said dead elites, uh, or war heroes, people who have fallen in battle. Um, and the long tubular object they hold as a staff of office or a weapon. In a number of instances, however, let me just put the four of them, I guess, up there, that so-called weapon looks to me a whole lot more like a flaming torch. Indeed, swirls of smoke appear with many of these figures. Even those figures that do seem to hold a weapon could be fire priests, because, and I don't have time to go into this, but this is where the kid of Mendoza would come back in. We know that Aztec fire priests were often very accomplished, distinguished warriors. So in conclusion, <laughs> And I think I, I, I have convinced myself um, <laughs> um, that regardless of whether Chichen's goggle reclining figures were mythological, which is possible, ancestral, possible, or contemporary heroes, their primary identity, which I think we've missed before, is that they were fire priests responsible for keeping the sun in motion through the conduct of those, these uh, fire rituals. So as we've seen, the bulk of the evidence for this identification has come from an examination of the figure's costumes and accoutrements. It is the men's eye rings, the stacked bows they wear, and their flaming torches, I have argued, that tell us who they really were, why they were important, and why they appear on certain buildings and perhaps not others. So I want to close by offering this talk in tribute to my dear friend and colleague, Patty Annawalt, who has so excited to make so as they say, wrote the book on the nature and importance of clothing in Mesoamerica. What was it, 45 plus years ago? <laughs> Those were the years to study in uh, Mesoamerica at UCLA. We already had Nick. We had Lockwell Nick, the master of ritual, and we had Jim Lockhart, the social uh, historian with his feet right on the ground. And then we get this 
snappy, cute young thing who comes, just finished her work at the University of Columbia, Columbia University. And here she came, and as you can see from this wonderful paper she gave, she was sharp. So anybody who came to study Mesoamerica in those years really benefited. Sadly, UCLA isn't maintaining that, that uh, particular. Well. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to back and fill and sit down. <laughs>